to go through those letters. And I said, I cannot. Emotionally, I cannot do that. Well, finally, I had an operation on my ankle that uh, I had to have a cast for 14 weeks. <laughs> if I had to do that again, I think I would I wear a uh, something, but I wouldn't go through it again. And, and then she said, I'll set up a table for you upstairs and uh, get you all the pencils and pen and so on and go through the letters. There were 16,000 letters. And then as I was reading, I said, oh, there are so many here that could make a nice anthology. And I began to mark those to make a, 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 the anthology. And uh, as I was reading the letters, hour after hour, and many were, you know, meaningless. Uh, that man saved everything. <laughs> that man they broke the mold when that man uh, was born. Uh, it was unique. Uh, to tell you this, when he was Speaker of the House, back in 1941, he would go to the sessions of, of Congress in the trolley car with the newspapers under the arm and a pencil reading and so on. So when all the other members of the cabinet and so on had official cars and so on, uh, he, he would not do that. And uh, us, the children, we said, ah, now the, the official car is going to take us to school and so on. And he turned to us and said, no way. That is only for official business. So I think they broke the mold when uh, that, that man was born. So, uh, then suddenly I run into a letter that I had written him in 1968. And in the letter I was saying, why don't you just take a break from, because he was trying to unify the different Cuban groups uh, to face the regime, unify. Say, why don't you take a break and teach and and, uh, and, and uh, you know, Cubans have been so in, on ingrates with you. And that, well, I have the answer too, and the answer was there. And he lectured me. He lectured me. As you will understand, I cannot do that because your great grandfather fought in the first independence war in 1968, and your grandfather, and blah, 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 blah. And I felt that he was absolutely given me a lecture for telling him that. So then I kind of felt a little bit more inclined to do the book, but this lady right here wouldn't let me. Constantly, constantly, you have to do that, you have to do that, until four years ago I decided, okay, I, I, I'll start, I'll start, and I began to write the history of those, uh, of those seven years. Now anybody, and I am sure 99% of, of what you guys are here, have what I call a, make a comics classic version of Cuban history. Okay, and why do I say a comics classic? Because you have all the cliches. And one of my, my uh, interests, basic interest, was to tell the reader, you don't know what Cuba was. Absolutely. Uh, you have, not you, but there are people who say, oh, it was a poor backward country. Wrong. It was a very well advanced, educated country with a vibrant middle class, educated in the best schools in the United States, with 80% of literacy grade, uh, with the workers. Uh, another idea, another cliche that comes is a poor peasant with a hat and starving. There were no peasants uh, starving in Cuba because the peasants were part of the sugar industry, and the sugar industry. Uh, uh, offer the, uh, the, the, the workers incredible labor rights and insurance and the rest of pain and so on. Uh, so it was in a poor backward country. We had already the Cubans in, in 1958 finally controlled the, uh, the source of the national industry, the, the main income of Cuba. 62% was already in Cuban hands. So the idea of the United States exploiting the Cubans is absolutely, completely false. Also, uh, Cuba, another idea was uh, under a brutal dictator, Batista. Uh, and uh, I can say this because my family opposed Batista from day one till day 100, the last, and Gloria's uh, family too, uh, even going through tremendous risk of, of being arrested by the, uh, the Secret Service and so on.
but Batista was not a brutal dictator, he was not a brutal tyrant, and this is going to surprise you. He was center of left, center left. And uh, some of the uh, great uh, social advances in Cuba were made under Batista's rule. Uh, so that is another <coughs> of the pensions of the American media or information to uh, give the American labels to uh, the rulers of all the countries. Like I read many times, Batista was a brutal rightist, conservative. You know. Okay? Uh, it, it, no, it was not. And uh, you know, my friend, uh, Mr. Carbonell, who's uh, written the, the foreword here, has defined Batista perfectly for posterity. I have another definition of him, but he has defined Batista perfectly for the future. He said Batista was a part time dictator with a democratic complex. <laughs> and, and when he was when he was in Cuba from six from fifty two to fifty nine, we had freedom of the press, we had freedom of uh, education, everything was free. The only thing is we had limited political rights. So I, I, that idea should be banished. Another idea is that Castro was not a communist before 1959, and the policies of the United States pushed him to be a communist. Oh, had we uh, had we played the game differently, uh, he would not have embraced the Soviet Union. Castro was a communist since 1954, and that is all in the documents that have surfaced in the last three or four years. And uh, also the only choices that American press gave to Americans here is that there were two choices only, Batista or Castro. Another fallacy, another myth. Because perhaps the strongest force was the one in between, the electoral constitutionalist force, because most of the Cuban people wanted a, a peaceful solution to the impasse created by the coup d'etat of Batista. But for that force to emerge victorious, you have to have honest elections and so on. Okay. So we find ourselves, you know, my family, my dad and so on, we found ourselves that we were attacked by uh, the, uh, the uh, forces of the uh, uh, Batista as well as by the forces of Castro. And third positions, or what we used to usually call silent majorities, uh, the only way that they can express themselves is through the counting of ballots and so on. My father believed that that could be done. And that is why he went to the elections. Uh, they say that uh, every country in a generation or so produces a Cassandra, okay, who tells, tells the, uh, the people what is going to happen in the future. Uh, my father was a Cassandra. And I will read a couple of his uh, statements here that I, I uh, quoted in the book. But you know what? Cassandras are not welcome. Cassandras are hated because people don't like to look at the reality, especially when what Cassandra said comes out true. So Cassandra doesn't have the benefit of being, ah, oh, you were right, and so on. No, no, because the, the existence of a Cassandra reminds people of their mistakes. So uh, uh, I'll read a couple of, of segments here. For instance, a, um, uh, he, uh, a, um, in 58, when the elections were approaching, okay, let me see. Five Cuban political leaders got together and appealed to the nation. And as you, if, if you read the book, you will find that Cuba, of course, nothing like the United States, but Cuba was the first country in the Western Hemisphere, and I include here the Europe. They had color TV, and the, the networks, radio and television network, covered the country from one end to the other. So they went to a TV. And uh, my father and the other four leaders uh, said this. Uh, they were talking to uh, the Cubans of public opinion. I quote, we are joined by a great common cause that must be put ahead of our differences, which is our commitment to resolve the terrible quarrel dividing the Cuban family through the ballot box 